Jordan, what's happening, man? How are you feeling? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Very excited to have today's guest on, Matt Black. Matt was part of the legendary electronic DJ duo and production duo Cold Cut. Um, Cold Cut's been in the game for a while. They really started to rise in the, the late 1980s, but then went on to, to pioneer electronic music and largely lay a lot of the foundation that's led to the prevalence, growth, and emergence of electronic music today. I think they were some of the first artists to really sample other forms of music and, and other kind of recorded music in their stuff. I and mean, we even talk about the, the evolution of remixed music in today's episode. Um, but beyond being a part of the, the DJ and production duo Cold Cut, He's also the founder of the, the legendary UK record label Ninja Tune, who's released records with Run the Jewels, Bonobo, Peggy Goo, Ross from Friends. I mean, the, the list goes on. Uh, and I think it was really incredible to learn from Matt and his journey as an artist and as an entrepreneur, as a record label, uh, record label owner, a, a gearhead, all of the above. Uh, really enjoyed this one. What do you think, Jordan? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, we don't really have people on our episodes that have been in the industry for as long as he has. And, and you can feel it, you know, that he has a lot of passion for what he does and that he just loves music. So that obviously came out in his um, founding story for Ninja Tune, where he just wanted to give artists a fair deal. And, and he's one of the first labels that I heard of to actually represent and promote that 50-50 model that he speaks on in the episode. So um, I just think it's really great to hear from somebody who's kind of have their their hand in a bunch of different things and, and has the perspective and and, and the energy to, to show for it, you know? Yeah, so before we dive into this week's episode, we do have some other pretty exciting news to share. Right. So a couple of weeks ago, we interviewed the CEO of a distribution company called Vidia. And the conversation went so well, and the distribution platform seemed so awesome that we decided to actually take a demo of the platform. Yeah, and I think it was really incredible when we did get to actually tour the platform because not only do they offer the, the capabilities to distribute audio and video to over 100 different streaming platforms around the world, but they also offer a suite of other services like rights management, analytics, content protection, accounting, marketing, right. and more. Exactly. NVIDIA makes it really easy for independent labels, managers, and creators to focus on their business strategy by propping them up with a solid infrastructure and gives them a back office support to need for them to scale. So I'm not sure, Sam, if you saw the article in, in Rolling Stone when Jesus is Born was released, that there was a company that actually released it within 24 hours of request, and that was that was Vidya. Yeah, I mean, when, when Kanye Kanye's going to call, man, you better answer, and Vidya answers quick. <laughs> I, I like to see it. So right. I think for us, now that uh, Vidya is sponsoring the podcast, I, I think it's so important for us that when we are actually finding and, and evaluating different sponsors, that they're creating products that are really going to help you guys. And I think Jordan's experience as a manager and mine as a marketer, um, without any, I mean, with no hesitation, we think this is an incredible platform. So really do want to encourage you guys to apply to be able to use it. Video did spin up a unique app uh, application page exclusively for Music Business Podcast listeners. So whether you're a label, manager, or an artist, or even a YouTube creator looking for a, a distribution partner, Go to video.com slash MVP to request an invite. That's V-Y-D-I-A dot com slash MVP. So really want to encourage you guys to check it out. Um, please go ahead and do so. And without any further ado, let's get into this week's episode with Matt Black. Matt, how are you doing, man? Very excited to have you on today. Yeah, terrific. Thanks for the invitation. Good to be here. For sure. So I think there's there's a lot to cover, but I think at the, the start, I really want to hear about the, the journey with kind of cold cut, its emergence, you deciding to, to really go into that and, and partner up. Um, can you talk about when the inception of cold cut and the, the journey there? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it depends how far. I'm going to be 60 next year, so we've got like 60 years to cover if you want, but we'll try and uh, compress it a bit. But, you know, ever since I was a kid, I was into sound and messing around with sound, and I used to get old radios and um, you know, make noises. And I had a little reel-to-reel -reel tape deck my uncle gave me. And, um, and then my sister had piano lessons, but it looked like a lot of hard work. But I <laughs> loved music, and I wanted to make sound and make music. And so then in my teens, um, I had a little geeky bunch of friends at school, and we got a designed for a synthesizer out of electronics magazine and started to build that me and my mate we also found um, some old disco equipment outside the youth club and we bought the lot for five pounds and started doing discos at, at school and so i've been doing this for quite a while really my mum um said uh, i i used to do a thing where i'd get these toy robots and wire up some bulbs and lights and stuff and my mum said oh it's a sound and light show 
So that was a bit of encouragement for my mum, I think. Encouraged me enough. I'm still doing sound and light shows, basically. Uh, <laughs> it's 55 years later. Um, and uh, at college, uh, I had a bunch of friends. We were just really into like getting high and getting really into black music. That was just a huge thing for us. And um, I was the one that sort of decided to try and make a career out of it. A brief stop as a computer program. I was always really into tech and um, and science fiction and, and science. But the music, the love of music and uh, was something very strong. Um, and so, you know, through college, um, we were doing a lot of parties and like I say, collecting a lot of records and that thing of being with your mates and just sitting around really grooving on music and having parties and so on. That, that was a, the main thing I got out of college was that basically a bunch of mates and we were all into this, this passionate thing about music and um you know, i uh to dive right in i'm i'm not um afraid of the term black music i think it's important for people to understand where the music has come from and it's, that's the music and the, the passion that's that's fueled my life and um so in in my own way i try to use technology to make music as i say not having a, mu a musical training background as a musician as such i was always a bit more of a tech geek and um then uh well after a while moved to london started playing at a few parties djing i was very influenced by uh what was coming out of america in terms of hip-hop and the idea of the scratch dj people like grandmaster flash grand mixer d street the great hip-hop originators and it just blew my mind and my friends as well and um you know, I was like, I want to do that. I want to learn to do that. So painfully, slowly, I'd sort of learned a, a bit about DJing and scratch DJing and break beats and so on. Um, got a four track cassette and um, decided to try and make a record like the stuff that was coming out of New, New York and the States. In particular, uh, some records by uh, Double D and Steinsky to clever Jewish guys from New York who were in love with putting sounds together in hip hop. And they made these very wonderful, humorous, skillful cut up records called lessons one, two, and three. And we heard these and it's like, I wanted, wanted to do something like that. So at that point I met Jonathan in a secondhand record shop, which is where, you know, when used to meet the heads who were into music and uh, dig, digging on, uh, on the, uh, the, the sounds in the shop and, you know, crate digging, trying to find those break beats, trying to find those rare funk tracks. The rare groove thing in London was a big thing at the time with people like Norman Jay um, and Paul Anderson. We had Jazzy B from Soul to Soul. We were all on, eventually got onto Kiss FM, the pirate station. But John and I hooked up and we formed Cold Cut and we decided to make a record and put out a cut up hip hop DJ mix. And that was Say Kids, What Time Is It? So that's basically where Cold Cut started. Sorry, a bit that's of awesome. a. a a, a rant but that's the the build up to where we came from basically no i love it and i think it, it definitely continued to to develop and grow on to do great things i know there are a couple of songs too i mean even like the the seven minutes of madness eric b and rakeem uh remix and um like that was a good one Aut yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> autumn leaves too kind of as it shifted more towards kind of the ibiza balearic vibes um can you talk about, I mean, those two records alone were, I mean, very, I mean, are like legendary classic records. I mean, can you talk about the, the development, the promotion of those songs and how you were, obviously, I'm sure it was fun in the creation process, but even when it came to um, turning and building a following and, and reception around those records the way it did, can you talk about that journey of those songs becoming those hits? Yeah, it's interesting to look back at it from that perspective, mate. Um, you know, what I can say was it, it was very natural. It just all flowed naturally. I mean, it was a different time. I sometimes joke that that was when the world was young and everything sounded good. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff has been done now and it's kind of hard to break out of that and do something new. But at that time, things were wide open, especially as far as sampling and sound collage goes. And, the, you know, the, the energy of, of hip hop um, was phenomenal. And that, that was cascading out in all different directions. Also, the, the whole London scene it was a multicultural, multiracial scene. We all wanted to get together and, and do parties, get high and get into the music and dance and get off with each other. That was a powerful thing as well. And um, I think quite a, a key thing in 
the evolution of London as this kind of what the best thing about uh, London is that it's a, a melting pot of all different kinds of people and cultures. And, um, you know, there'd been a lot of racism in the UK, there still is, but in London and other cities at that time, there was a, this excitement about the music and young people getting together, having a good time, looking at each other, recognizing each other and, and, and sharing and, uh, and partying together. And it was actually a powerful thing. And I think that's had gone on to have a pretty big, impact really so in a way that was kind of the roots of the the uk music scene with all respect to other cities like bristol which is a fantastic music generating city birmingham liverpool manchester they also got their vibe as well but i'm from london ninja tunes kind of a london phenomena so that's why what i speak about why i was part of and um you know in london uh, we'd released these records which were initially sold out of john's second hand uh, he was manager of reckless records so that was just sold there um, and then suddenly we were actually selling quite a lot of records, just sort of over the counter, more or less. And a, a smart um, A&R guy called Julian Palmer, who was at Fourth and Broadway, asked us if we'd like to do this remix of Paid in Full. And um, yeah, again, that just came quite naturally because suddenly we cold cut was in a thing that people were, were liking. We'd never sent out any promo copies. We didn't really try and promote ourselves. Um, but suddenly the odd journalist was sort of picking the phone up and asking if they could talk to us. And um, Julian was a, like a good A&R guy, was actually awake to this new sound and that something new was in town. It's not just us, there was the whole DJ thing. It was just nascent then, just starting to bubble up. Um, and so we got the chance to make work with a major US hip hop act because John and me were like, wow, this is it. Um, we asked if we could have some royalty on the records. They told us to get lost. <laughs> 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 um but uh, nowadays i note that remixes do get points on record sometimes because it's recognized that you can as a remixer you can take a record somewhere completely different and it's more actually like mm -hmm. a production role um but at the time yeah we just were given some copies of the record a couple of days in island studio and told to get on with it and we came out <laughs> with, with this uh this this mashup um and it was the right thing at the right time and yeah uh, suddenly we were on the, we only got paid 700 pounds. So later we did our own version called Not Paid Enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Eric B and Rakim Shonoff got paid from it. And, uh, and we got on the cover of the NME, which was, you know, the kind of music Bible at the time. So um, right. that was a great result for us to sort of suddenly, you know, John and I love music. We'd followed it. We'd been, we'd read the NME. We'd followed the scene. And then suddenly we were actually on the cover. That was a quite a big moment. But it really, it all evolved quite naturally just from the excitement and enjoyment of wanting to make records by mashing up stuff like a DJ and then put it out there, something that people could enjoy and dance to. Right, right. Um, and yeah, I think, I think um, DJs now are just so global. It's like, when a when a dj puts out a remix of a song that that dj could be 10 15 times as big as the artist so then at that point it's like you know me remixing your record is actually doing you a favor in addition to helping <laughs> me um you know put some music out so then it's like yeah of course i should get some points or something because at this point it's like you know i'm Diplo and i'm yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah. Um, which leads me kind of to my next question and how do you kind of think remix culture has evolved over time? Um, obviously that's one big portion of it, but, um, are there any positives that you see from the evolution of remix culture, any negatives that you kind of see, I guess, just generally what's your opinion on it? Well, it's, it's become a huge thing, hasn't it? And, um, people even talk about remix culture and use that term outside of, uh, of music, you know, mashup culture, the remix, I think is a term that's enjoyed some usage in other forms of, of culture as well. And who's that? Um, there's a professor who's who'll come to me in a minute, but it, it's a, it's a topic that people study on their PhDs and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm quite happy about that. And actually I do like the idea that the, the term of remixing, taking some stuff and remixing it, mashing it up, pushing it together and adding new elements and then making it into something new is a, a useful form. I, I have a biochemistry background as well, so I kind of see life mm. as a remix. If, you know, that's what, <laughs> what genetics is about, is DNA mm -hmm. is remixing itself all the time. So, um, 
But in terms of music remixing, like I say, when we started off, the, the remix was quite a limited kind of canon, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. you know, people like Shep Pettibone and some of the great New York DJs would get a credit for their remixes, but the, the remixes generally weren't, they were not that radical. And right. it was with the, the, the contribution of the mix and mash attitude of hip hop and real time deck using decks to collage stuff together that freed things up. And at that time when we did paid in full, we had no sampler. We had decks, uh, a, a multi-track in the studio and a bell delay line, which we were shown you could loop a short section. And that's how we did the rhythm track, took a short section, mm -hmm. sampled it off the vinyl and looped that. So it was like a primitive sampling technique. Um, but then we decided, you know, we could sort of throw in the kitchen sink as well. And it was John, my partner, who suggested the, probably the most notorious single sample of our career, which was the Ofra Haza Imnin Alu vocal piece, which just, there was that moment we were in my, my uh, little setup at home, messing around with stuff, and John got this record out. We stuck it on the turntable and found if we slowed it right down to minus eight, it was perfectly in tune with the bass line. Mm unpaid in full and it kind of stayed in time as well we were like looked at each other yes yeah, so we're onto a winner with this that sounds really amazing and in fact that in a way was the the vocal hook that made that remix so big i think a really new elements that we added now if you look at that that was a massive steal right so what happened was that offer hazar her people got onto island <laughs> and said to them, we want a piece of that record because <laughs> the massive steal and island um you know John and I had, as we say, we're not, no points, guys. Come on, just get on with it. Here's 700 quid. We're like, okay, well, fuck <laughs> you. Here's the record. You <laughs> sort out any legal problems that came out with it. Because we were already aware with Double D and Steinsky's records that, you know, clearance was, you, there was no, you could not get clearance. It, clearance wasn't even thought of, actually. Mm -hmm. what, what we knew was like, you put other people's music on, you've got a major problem, you're not going to be able to release it. So, mm -hmm. to their credit, Highland worked around that. They did a deal, and I think Offer ended up with a third of the rights on that record, which is, I think, broadly fair. You know? mm -hmm. And I think that was um, uh, a key point in the emergence of a framework that sampling was not going to go away. We were going to want to sample all these, this treasure trove of the history of recorded music on the right. And But if we did that, then there had to be a framework whereby you could legitimately do that. And that meant talking to the rights holders and the original artists and making a deal with them so that everyone got a piece of whatever pie came out of it. And that is the case now that, um, you know, generally we, we try and clear any samples that we use because we've had some, as a record label, we've had some painful experiences. And soon after that came pump up the volume with, from Mars and they did have some serious, cause that got to number one and fulfilling the legal maxim that where there's a hit, there's a writ, you know, you just <laughs> do a mash up for you and your mates. Probably no one's too bothered about it. Suddenly if you're on the TV and the radio, you can, or especially if you're on the advert, you're going to be hearing from those people that you sample. So the legal framework for sampling started to evolve at that time and has become now something that, that broadly works. Um, you know, one of the things I've, uh, uh, I've absorbed is never sample the Rolling Stones. You will get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, they will end up with a hundred percent or more of the royalty. Um, so it's just not worth it, you know. Um, but I, the, the, the uh, Star Wars is another. Keep away from George Lucas and Star Wars. You will get fucked. So, um, but other people have taken a more uh, open attitude to it. And I well remember George Clinton, big hero of ours, you know, P Funk, it's like you know uh, such a an influence and saying well what do you think about Dilla Soul sampling your music and he was like well as long as they pay I'm cool with it Dilla Soul pay mm -hmm. real good and he probably saw more royalties from that record than from quite a few years of, of P-Funk so I think that it was cool you know you credit you pay you make a deal everyone's happy and I, I think that's good so that that's one aspect of it the legal aspect and now of course you can do as you alluded to earlier, Jordan, if like someone, um, you know, a name DJ remixes your track, that can be a huge boost for you. And, uh, and you know, of course, people are well aware of their influence and that that can have a, a dollar tag on it as well. But 
hopefully it doesn't always have to be just purely reduced to dollars. It can be, hey guys, this is a collaboration. I'm going to benefit from this. You're going to benefit from it as well. It's a chance to do something new. And there's some good examples of that that, that come out. So I like collaboration. And for me, a remix is fundamentally a, a collaboration. It's, we've got an original track created by some people and then we've got some other creatives who are going to come in and take it somewhere else. And I, I, I live for collaboration. I think it's great. But fundamentally, yeah. for me, that's what it's about. Right. That's amazing. Who have been some of your, uh, the, the people you've had most fun collaborating with? And what do you think are the, the keys to uh, successful collaboration? Well, um, if I could bring it back up, bang up to date, actually, our most recent collaboration has been one of the most enjoyable, successful ones of our career. And it's the Keller Kettler project, which we just released a couple of months ago. So that was a really widespread collaboration, which came out of an invitation to come to South Africa and work with local musicians there. Um, the Keller Kettler Library, which is like a cultural activism library with Raran Malose and Joe Berg, um, got together within Place of War, a UK charity. And um, Keller Kettler were asked who they'd like to collaborate with. And they gave a list of Ninja Tune artists at the top of which was Cold Cut. Um, long story short, uh, with a lot of input from my wife, who was very keen we took up this invitation, we wound up in Joburg and suddenly we were in Soweto in a, in a room by the train tracks called Trackside Studios um, mm. with a, a free remit to get it on, collaborate and make something new. And that um, took a, well, we had the first a few days in the studio there, which was very exciting and extremely, you know, stimulating and, and interesting for John and me. Um, to be there in Africa, the, the root of so much of the music which has formed our lives and careers, and um, and working with some great musicians. John, like me, is not a trained musician, but we have a certain fluency with putting sounds together, and um, we were able to come out of it with some good tracks. Um, long story short, came back to the UK, um, and uh, I had a, quite a, it's actually two years ago, pretty much, Today, I was just out of hospital after a major car crash. So mm. that slowed me down for quite a while. But um, we got over that. And uh, we invited Tony Allen, the legendary Afrobeat originator, mm -hmm. drummer. Um, and then other musicians from London and abroad as well. Keller Kettler is about res response, call and response. So we were called to South Africa. We responded so to form that, start <laughs> that collaboration. And then we called out to other people as well beginning with tony allen um and then with uh, my best friend's son miles james is a fantastic guitarist and producer in london uh now and so i tapped him hadn't actually worked with him before he came in and then he suggested some other people and the ninjas our, our crew at ninja who are all like basically music heads that's what ninja tune is it's a conspiracy of people that well <laughs> really into music um and uh so then we ended up um, asking people like Shabaka Hutchins, Tamar Osborne, Afla Sake, um, and you can check out the the, um, the 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 list on the album, which is a pretty decent uh, list of collaborators. And the Keller Keller Keller, Keller project, uh, I think, is probably my best, most enjoyable collaboration to date, and um, it's just been an absolute blast and a privilege to work with so many great musicians and have a, a chance to shape that into, into an album. So, yeah, I, as I've got older, I think I've got better at, I've relaxed more and I've got better at getting on with people. Um, mm -hmm. So, to again, credit my wife, Dinar Stafford, is certainly a huge influence in my life and um, she's helped me relax and enjoy people more. And uh, the the album, I think, is a good it's a collaboration between her and me as well. Actually, she's a, a collaborator on the album as well in so many ways. So um, that's I think showing that collaboration really collaboration is key. As Ruth Ruth uh, Daniels uh, in Place of War lady says, collaboration is key to sort of rediscovery, in, inventing new stuff, and telling untold stories as well. So Keller Kettler's, I think, a reason, a good example of that. Right. That's amazing. Right. That sounds incredible. Jordan, um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, collaboration has gotten a little bit easier with technology. Also, we see, uh, you know, platforms like Splice. Uh, we see, obviously, we're collaborating technically right now over video yeah. chat. <laughs> um, so what what do you think are some of the your, the most exciting advancements that you've seen just generally on the production slash collaboration front since you, since you started DJing? Whether well, that I mean, be technological, it, hardware or software or both or. Yeah. I mean, we live in a world of, we live in a networked world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like everything in human existence, it is, it's brilliant and it's crap at the same time. It has <laughs> and so it's like the terrible echo chambers of social media and, uh, you know, they're being used to manipulate people. But also it does enable us to hook up and talk to each other and collaborate. And I feel kind of that, um, Humanity is like a, an organism. You, you can think of humanity and the planet together, actually, as, a, as an organism. If you just consider humanity, it's like, as an organism, we've just had a huge upgrade to our nervous system. Mm -hmm. the, the ability for the different cells in that organism, i.e. us, to communicate, coordinate, and connect with each other has had a huge upgrade. And we're all sitting here trying to process all that information and all those connections like a, a zillion synapses constantly firing. Um, and not surprisingly, it's going to take us a while to get our heads around it. Um, but I'm hopeful that that will lead to a good outcome of, um, you know, what Technat Han, the Buddhist teacher, calls interbeing, the realization that we're all connected. Right. And I, not just in a technological way but in a spiritual way in a in a social way interdependence we're interdependent on each other and i think actually that's the real message the real take home from the wave of realization of, of communication and technological interconnectedness that we can see happening in music actually applies to everything so you can see music making and that kind of collaboration as a metaphor as or an example of the greater scale, the greater dimensions of interconnectedness, which are affecting all aspects of our life, which is very exciting. I think very, in, in, I'm broadly optimistic about that. So, um, you know, the obvious things like, for example, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you on the laptop, which is basically equipped like, a multi-million dollar studio was a few years ago mm -hmm. in terms of the effects units, the synths, the, the display, even the, um, the, the, the virtual studio environments and even not just audio as well. I can sit here and I can make a film. I can make an, 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 an audio visual real time performance using this machine. And I can beam that out to you. Actually, it's some, since lockdown, I've rebooted, uh, a project which I started more than 20 years ago called Pirate TV. This was before YouTube. Pirate TV was a streaming jam uh, that we set up, a weekly jam. And actually, we had other friends in other countries who picked it up as well. We're basically, we'd get together in my studio, get really high, plug in some instruments, <laughs> and do visuals and sound and beam it out on the internet to a small audience because not many people were on the connection then. But the idea was good that we could be a pirate television station and we, could, we didn't need to go through the mainstream media. We could be our own television channel. Um, and I did it you know, uh, for a few years and really enjoyed it. In fact, it was that experience of jamming with people that... Um, gave me the ability as someone without a formal production background and without a musical background to be able to be in the studio with a bunch of musicians and be of some use to directing them and helping get a direction going, which in Keller Kett has been the sort of my most advanced flowering of that, basically. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm quite happy to have I've restarted Pirate TV. If you tune in on a Wednesday night, go to Cold Cut on Facebook or coldcut.net, you'll find links to Pirate TV. In fact, I've even rebooted PirateTV.net, which was the original <laughs> domain, and that will get you there. And we stream out on Facebook, on Twitch, and on YouTube. Twitch is the sort of preferred platform with better audio quality. Um, and we have a little community of people that are well up for it, and they come along every week, and we chat, and they send in 
work that they've done, tracks, paintings, which I then mix in on the screen. My wife joins me in to do the video mixing, and it's a really nice collaborative um, community. So I'm quite excited by that. I mean, I don't want to um, just sit here in front of my computer for the rest of my life. I would like to get to with you your and, and, <laughs> and boogie and you know <laughs> get get the funk going and uh, not just be a, a virtual head and an appendage to my computer. But to right. do that again, there's there's a lot to be said for using the channels that we've got to do as much as we can. And I think it's it's going somewhere quite interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, That's amazing. The, the, the whole VR thing is perhaps the next step beyond that. We did, um, Glastonbury was cancelled this year, of course. Normally we're there mm-hmm. um, with Greenpeace. And uh, sorry, am I talking too much, not letting you guys get enough of it? No, please, man. Input to tell me to shut up. We like it. Go on too much. <laughs> no, all good. Um, but we will. <laughs> yeah. There was a, a, a virtual Glastonbury event called Lost Horizons, right? So that was staged in VR. Um, so Cold Cut were there in our 90s VR avatars, these little cartoons of Cold Cut, um, dancing around on stage. They hadn't got it quite right. So I was like with my head like this quite a lot of the time. Um, but uh, we we were part of this VR experience. We did we played a Cold Cut set, which was pre-recorded actually. Most of the sets were played that out. But people from around the world could put their VR headsets on and sort of be there in a virtual space and it was kind of the first thing like that that's been done um so that was pretty interesting um but yeah to rewind it back again um you know there's so many ways to collaborate and communicate now but the highest bandwidth most enjoyable most real thing is being in a room with some other human beings and one should keep that center stage because it's a very wonderful valuable thing for sure my brother um my older brother is a musician also and he used to say that you know that your laptop is kind of like the easel but the studio is kind of like your art studio and no matter where you go no matter where you bring the easel you're always going to work the best in the studio yes you know yes that's a great observation you know in working on the album as well for instance, we were working on the artwork with the delightfully named Mr. Fuzzy Slippers from Joburg. Uh, Lisa Lose, his name is, I think. Um, but we like to call him Mr. Fuzzy Slippers. And um, what we got in the end a really nice bit of artwork, which I'm, I think is great. And uh, that was his, his creation. But working on that together, it was quite... Um, we were held back by the fact that we were not in the same room because when you're in the same room as someone, you can lean over their shoulder and tap them on the shoulder and say, no, I didn't mean that mate. I mean that this got to go on this side. (laughs) That bit needs to be as big as this. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's no substitute for being in the same room. We do screen sharing, screen sharing. I've been doing a lot more recently. It's a good example of collaboration. You know, if I'm talking with you, uh, we're working on something together. We can describe it in words, but if there's anything visual going on, it helps a lot if we can see the same thing on screen. So when we were editing the documentary for the Keller Kettler, we found out that rather than swapping, can you move this bit, you know, long emails with each other, the best thing was to get both of us on screen with the timeline in Premiere at the same time and actually watch it. Even if it's a bit jerky, it's still um, a a lot quicker. And with music as well, you know, it, it's not great doing music over Zoom, for example, but I can still hear if you're helping me, say, work on something in your studio, um, say you're playing a guitar line, for instance, I can still hear what you're doing sufficiently well to go, yeah, that's great, but could you do that one again? Or can you play that one, you know, through the fuzz pedal or whatever? So just that kind of having the as much as possible the, the sound or the visual available to you and not trying to do it all in words. Um, is, uh, is, is very important. So just hold on one second. I don't know if you know the, um, the app Endless, E-N-D-L-E-S-S-S. Mm-hmm. This is a new project. You check it out. This is um, a guy I know called Tim Exile, who's a musician and, and uh, inventor. And he and his crew have come up with this rather cool way of collaborating to make music online. 
um, well worth checking out. They did a Kickstarter recently and raised a significant amount of money to do a VST version of what at the moment is just an iOS app. But that's wicked. Um, it harks back to some experiments I did with a thing called Res Rocket in the 90s and early noughties with Tim Brand from Dreadzone and Willie Henshaw, who moved to the States and is a photographer now, but um, used to be in the band London Beat. But uh, that got, got me on, you, know, you probably don't know, but Tomorrow's World was a cult, very popular UK TV program about the future and inventions. And it had, you know, I used to watch it as a kid and then we got on Tomorrow's World with this Res Rocket thing and I think 2000 it was with Sinead O'Connor and Brinsley Ford from Aswad and um, but Endless is the sort of update of that. And then in the last couple of days, I've been given one of these, which I haven't you, used yet. Yeah, this is that's... basically a Raspberry Pi, right? That's a whole computer yeah. in a box with sound. And um, Anyway, I'm told that you can do real-time audio collaboration with, with very low latency using this. So wow, I'm going to get on that tomorrow and check it out. Um, it is called Aloha, A. L O H A and it's from Sweden. I think that's the right name. Let me just check that one second. Yes. Yes, yeah, Simon Little, who used to be um Bonobo's uh keyboard player, turned me on to this. So he sent me over, they've sent me over from Sweden one of these boxes. So I'm quite excited to check that out because real time collaboration would be with for making music would be a, a funny a fun thing yeah, to, to get going for sure. For sure. And it's yeah. been tough. I know with, with COVID, I know there's been a couple other solutions out there, but yeah, it's been super challenging when it comes to, um, I mean, your passion for hardware and for technology too is, is really cool to see. And I know you've worked on some hardware products yourself. Um, when it comes to, I, I know in electronic music, there's definitely, you have like hardware purists and then you have some people that are like exclusively producing songs off their laptop. Right. Um, mm-hmm. There's unique pros and cons to both approaches. Absolutely. What do you think are some of the pros and cons on both sides? And where do you kind of sit on that spectrum? Well, first I'd say I, I sit squarely in the middle because I, I love all that stuff. And mm-hmm. I don't get involved in what hackers used to call holy wars, right? Yeah. yeah. As in, yeah, PC is better. Mac is crap. <laughs> no, Mac is brilliant. PC is crap. Forget it. I've used those. I've swung every which way. I've been using computers for getting on for 50 years now right and so uh um and similarly with you know some people will will swear by the analog synthesizers and i mean i do find it quite funny um how extreme people will take their views on on many things when really you just need to widen up man you know yeah yeah, yeah. if it's good for you if you you know you could make a fantastic symphony on a penny whistle if you had the mm-hmm. ideas and the skill, and that would be your instrument, and fair play to you if you're someone that believes that the, the penny whistle or the acoustic guitar is another superb instrument. I wish I could mm-hmm. play it. Um, and uh, you know, and, and then the, you, you right now there's some kids sitting in their bedroom somewhere, probably making a new style of music on their on their Android phone. You mm-hmm. know, like Burial did a few years ago. You know, Burial, the UK artist. I just it was came at one of these times when electronic music seemed to have kind of run out of ideas. And then a kid in London sitting with a really cheap laptop and no software came up with a whole new sound and blew everyone away. And I, so that, that's happening. I hope it's happening right now. In Durban, in South Africa, you should check out GOM. G-Q-O-M, I think it's spelled. And there's a, we've, yeah, we've yeah, yeah. put a GOM track on on the album when i heard this just before we went to south africa a friend said uh, fabrice this photographer said have you, do you know about gom i was like no i don't he said check it out there's this documentary i checked it out and i heard a new rhythm that really turned me on for the doesn't that doesn't happen every day it's quite hard to come up with a really exciting new rhythm nowadays and mm-hmm. I, I heard this mm-hmm. it's like wow this is some like african futuristic almost like dubstep but it, it and the beat is so. Um, there's a particular beat. They're pretty much all 128 BPM, 120, right. 29. It's quite often happens that you know a star mm-hmm. will coalesce on a certain BPM and keep rigidly to it. And the beat's pretty much the same. But it's a great beat, and I think it yeah. might be my sort of you know white boy head 
I'm so used to conventional beats that this is, it intrigues me. I can't, I can't quite get down with it. And so it's, it's intriguing, that thing that where th- things aren't exactly all spelled out. There's something new there and it's in- mm-hmm. engaging and you want to penetrate it and sort of get inside it and understand what it is. That's what GOM's doing for me. I, I, I recommend listening to some... Um, it's been out for a few years now, but again, invented by some kids with nothing in Durban. I think they had one PC between the whole posse of them. And they just yeah. come up with, uh, I, to my mind, a real step forward in electronic music. So, um, sorry, I'm not quite sure where I was going. No, with that, no, that's but, awesome. Uh, and and I mean, I, I think no, Check that same vein. I mean, yeah, we're, um, I mean, that same vein too. Uh, what's interesting is uh, music internationally. I mean, there's all these different like niches, and if you think about like electronic, I mean, it's obviously continued just to snowball into all these different like sub segments of electronic. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, to some extent, like electronic music in its like poppiest form is some of the some of the world's biggest artists are by nature like electronic artists but on the flip side you still have all these different underground sub genres which are are cool um can you talk your i mean from your perspective seeing the continued development emergence and ultimately dominance of electronic music and how that's changed throughout the years yeah i mean a huge topic you're asking there yeah. Sam, um, I would easily spend a couple of hours on that. Um, I mean, firstly, I'd observe that electronic music isn't really a genre. It's a set of techniques for making music. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can't really divvy that up very cleanly because it just sort of splurges out of the boxes. You know, you could argue that all music now, apart from someone singing on an acoustic guitar around a campfire with no amplification, and no one recording it, yeah, that's purely acoustic. But, you know, even a symphony orchestra, when you're hearing that, it's mediated through a bunch of electronic devices, isn't it? It's going to be, mm-hmm. All music is digital that you're going to be hearing now. Probably even a piece of vinyl would have been mastered through some kind of digital box. So all music that, we, that is mediated through technological channels is electronic. And um, I think it's good to just pull back and 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 realize that, um, you know, EDM, which has been a big thing in the states, right? I, f- mm-hmm. I find that electronic dance music it's a ridiculous term. You know, I I did a gig with Skrillex actually just before he went massive. Mm-hmm. Uh, good clever promoter in Brighton book, booked him just at the right time. Um, and I was amazed. I thought this is a really exciting new sound, brilliant, super heavy, super aggressive. Like, yeah, I can see the kids are going to be well into this. And it has gone massive. And in some ways in the States, I've heard it said that you know, this was the electronic um, breakthrough that enabled kids uh, who were uh, Americans who were sort of still stuck in a rock time warp to break out of that and embrace electronic music. Would you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Say it's just it again. something I heard that um, EDM was the step forward for electronic music that allowed Americans and American youth to get out of the kind of rock time warp that they were in and embrace finally the electronic music. You know, even all the waves right. of, of of techno, for instance, and um, dubstep and so on did, didn't didn't really do that, but EDM did it. And I remember seeing the crowd for the Skrillex show. And um, you know, this was not your normal hipster crowd. It was more like a sort of almost mixture of punks and shoegazers and new wave. And it was a real yeah. interesting crowd to be getting into a sound which was like kind of electronic heavy metal. Mm-hmm. So I, I was fascinated by that. And I, I've, that's, that's gone on. But of course, like most things, sort of the initial energy tends to can't, can't sustain itself forever. And it gets over commercialized and over commodified. And, some of the the sexiness and uniqueness gets sucked out, but then that's time for a bunch of other people to go and no, I fuck that that's that shit is dry. We're going to do something else, and underground something else is fermenting and will no doubt spring up in 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 due course. Um, it's been fascinating in London actually that you've got two main new shoots in London the last couple of years. I would say one is is drill which is what Grimes sort of turned into. Yeah. 
again, as is very often the case, an import from the US, which the UK has then took and mutated and turned into something else. Mm-hmm. But I like the beats. I'm not so into the rap, but the the beats are pretty avant-garde, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then the other is the the uh, the jazz scene. Uh, you know, you've had you've had jungle drum and bass, you've had dubstep, you've had grime, you've had trill. These are all electronic genres that owe a lot to hip hop, actually. Um, but they they are they are f- fundamentally about electronic beats. And then uh, now you've got f- from South London again, which has been the part of the UK that again and again, in my view, has flowered up these outbreaks of new sounds and new exciting new culture one of the poorest areas of london um the, there's a jazz scene from from london and south london now with people like some of whom we've got on the album like kamasi washington and tom mish and joe amon jones ezra collective um kolakata it's also also involves a sort of afro beat because there's a lot of African and Nigerian influence in London. African, if you watch the little documentary, you will see Miles, my, my mate's uh, son there, talking about how big Afro beats have become in the UK scene at the moment. Um, but it's nice to see something that's not purely electronic based, that's more about musical skill and arrangement and proper composition rather than just stuff which is laid out on the grid with some samples and some sound. So uh, and we we sort of plugged into that with the Keller Keller Kettler album actually, and got some you know, some of the, the talents on the album are coming out of that scene. So those have been two things I've got my eye on in London at the moment. Quite excited about. I'd like to see if there's going to be a jazz drill crossover. Actually, we've got a couple of tracks in production that are flirting with that. That's cool. That's amazing. So then, when it comes to, I mean, even if you look at like the the Ninja Tune roster these days, and I, I know Ninja Tune has evolved a lot but even then too i mean i think that pays homage to the diversity of however you want to bucket it dance music electronic music um so can you now kind of dive in a little bit to the the journey of launching ninja tune and and how you went from being an artist into really trying to create a platform to help put on and distribute other artists yeah okay thank you so you know when we started off like i said we knew that we couldn't re- legally release what we were doing, that no record label would understand it, so we decided to do it ourselves. Then off the back of that, we got some notoriety, we got signed, um, and then suddenly we found ourselves in the position of being signed to a label that wanted us to just keep turning some kind of sausage machine handle to crank out hits that were sort of pretty generic and similar to what we'd done. And frankly, John and I were A, not interested in doing that, and B, not able to do it. We would, We were not, you know we were literally unable to function like a, like a machine. Um, perhaps we just didn't have the skill or anyway. So that ended up being quite uncomfortable and the position that um, I think it's perhaps worth speaking to this a little bit that, um, you know, I feel quite passionately that music and art are not about being a commodity. That is not what they're about. and everything's commodified nowadays in this world and i think that often crushes the soul out of things and crushes out what made it special and good and human in the beginning and so in our journey that kind of happened to us so the record company they pay you some money then they think that they own your ass they're going to make the decisions about what your record's going to be like if you don't provide stuff that fits up into their their grid of how uh, they think they can market you you've got problems and they'll pressurize you to do that. And then if you don't do it, eventually you'll be dropped, which is what happened to us. But so we found that we kind of lost rights to the cold cut name because we'd signed this deal with some pretty, pretty, it's pretty bad legal advice, actually. Watch out people for signing that contract. You better have someone have a look at that. And um, ideally you would understand some of it yourself rather than trusting someone else, even if you pay them a lot of money to do it they may not do a very good job of that. That's what happened to us. We got ended up signing a very onerous contract, which still means that we don't, the rights to some of the old cold cut material are still locked up with uh, Sony BMG and we, we will never get them back again. But um, the rewind to 1990, 
we couldn't put out records under the cold cut name other than ones that the record company would say it's got to be like this. So we started Ninja Tune as an escape pod from the trap we found ourselves in. We realized that we could have some other identities and other aliases and that we could use them to put out music, which was what we were really into doing more than just being on, getting on top of the pops again. Um, and that was the birth of Ninja Tune. It was our so say, Technicolor escape pod from the music business swamp that we found ourselves stuck in. And um, so obviously, from the beginning, it was artist-led. And we just had this quite bruising experience of being signed to a label, being forced to make music that we didn't want, being controlled, um, and um, also not being accounted to fairly by the big life, the independent label um, that we got signed to initially. Uh, we never got our full payments from them. Um, one time we audited them and our auditor said they owed us 300 grand. We never got it. So I'm sure many musicians can relate to the difficulty in getting paid. I think broadly things might be a bit better nowadays because with technology, that shit that is itemized down to the play. Um, although with major companies, they tend to practice what's called black box accounting, which without getting into that, that can be not always that fair to the artist. And that's one of the reasons why on Ninja Tune with our artists, we have a different called a different kind of deal, which is an in, called the indie type of deal, which is a 50-50 profit split. So whatever the sources the money comes from, we take it in, we total it up, we take away the costs that we've had. If there's anything left, we split it 50-50 with the artists. Going back to what we were saying before, I've always found that a more collaborative framework to get a good relationship out of between artist and record label. So we started putting out these records as DJ Food and Bogus Order and some different identities. That kind of turned into what became called Trip Hop clever bit of marketing from a journalist there invented that phrase i think i was quite like that phrase sort of yeah. hip -hop, but something else you know um suffered as well from not really at that stage having rappers in the uk who could do anything other than badly imitate their american heroes so we left the rappers for the side for them to mature for a while which they did eventually and started throwing in all these jazz samples and freaking out and making it a bit more dubby and trippy and that became trip hop um, and people started buying these records and that through the 90s, through the 90s, that became quite a, quite a lick. And then people like Massive Attack as well from the Bristol Sound, they, they had their own take on trip hop, which also included incorporating songwriting into it. I, I love those guys. So that was a big step forward as well. Um, but other artists started coming to Ninja Tune saying, we really like what you're doing. We like the records you're putting out and we like what you stand for. Would you like to, to sign us? And so we did start signing other artists over the, initially it was just really a mechanism to release cold cuts music because we were blocked. But then we thought, well, we're going to have a record label. Other artists want to put their, their work out. Why not? And let's, let's give them a fair deal. The kind of deal which we wanted to have from a record label, but didn't get when we signed the contract with, uh, with major labels. So we thought we could, uh, offer people something good and people liked it and that's how ninja tune started and over the years that reputation um i think partly that that reputation of being an artist-led label has played really well for us people appreciate that um and fast forwarding to now um you know you'll hear people asking well is there actually any role for record labels um it's a good question one, one reason we started Ninja Tune was because we thought, well, you know, maybe what we're going to be doing if we do our own thing is going to be quite niche. And if so, it'd be better if we controlled that ourselves. Sorry. And didn't have to um, split that many ways with many middlemen and so on. We just do it ourselves, take responsibility for it ourselves. Um, and in a way, that's what Ninja Tune is. It came out of the artists wanting to control our own destinies and our own business as well. And now with technology and the different structures that have grown up out of that, it's a lot more practical for artists to do that. So it leaves quite an interesting different landscape than when we started. 
And then I guess as we wrap up, um, how do you think Ninja Tune has developed over the years? Well, one of the big changes for Ninja Tune is not uh, just cold cut some channel to put a music <laughs> on. I mean, it, it, it's uh, broadly, um, you know, Ninja Tune has become this pretty big thing. Um, and in a way, it's very much changed from what John and I set up. And it's like having a family and having kids, your life changes. And what grows up is not just about you anymore. And you have to you have to come to terms with that. And it's not always easy. And there are rows and power struggles and misunderstandings and beefs. And, and yet, you love each other. And if you can keep that in focus, then with goodwill and communication, you can work things out. So that's broadly what's happened with Ninja Tune. I'm very proud that we've been able to put out some some great music um, and give a platform to to some excellent artists that perhaps would otherwise have been marginalised and not been able to to get anywhere. So, you know, Bonobos are a good example of someone who's totally taken his own thing and by hard work actually and talent has made it big. Young fathers, I particularly interested in music having a political message. And those guys are full power and they come with a fantastic um, new cutting edge sound and their whole thing is great and highly political, which I think I'm so happy that we're putting out music like that. Um, there's just naming a couple of, uh, you know, the, the artists on the label, but we have, a, we put out, you know, well over a hundred artists work at this stage. It might, might be quite a bit more actually. I haven't been keeping score, but um there's a good body of music there that Ninja have put out. Actually, uh, 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 initially it was Jonathan and me, then a friend phoned up one day, a friend of a friend, and said, I want to come work for a label. We said, come on down. And that was Peter Quick. And he came and he never left. And actually, the success of the label is largely down to Pete's hard work and his, um, his very good way of... of uh, dealing with with people staying cool and being an honest and good and intelligent person and so all respect to pete and the, the team that he's built up john and i for a long time pretty much stepped back from the label once pete came in um he did a great job of running it and it was kind of our dna but um it was pete that implemented that and then funny enough recently over the last couple of years john and i wanted to get more involved again and um you know, with the current crises that we're having at the, the moment, um, I feel it needs all of our brain power to sort of network together and come up with the best solutions for, for the company and so that we can be the most use and the most benefit to our artists and to the, the world at large. So, in fact, John and I are more involved now um, in the label than we've been for a while, and that, that feels really good. But um, Ninja Tune, we, uh, we would... Um, there are four directors now. Adrian Kemp is younger than John, me and Pete, but he's brought a lot of youthful energy um, and intelligence to the company and he's having a big impact on the way the company's run. Um, we've also included him as a shareholder, uh, which is something that John and I did with Pete at an early stage as well. Again, collaboration, you know, in, including people. Um, motivating people by showing that you know we can we can share this we can do this for joint benefit that's what a collaboration can be about and john and i originally um started to have some rows about who would get the credit for this who did this who did that and we made a big deal at the beginning that we would split everything cold cut 50 50 no matter if he'd made the track or i was the one selling it or whatever we'd credit it to cold cut and that would be both of us and we'd split it 50 50 and that has provided a pretty useful framework. And you see a lot of other, um, quite some contemporaries of ours who also had partnerships, they haven't lasted. And I think our decision to do that was pretty handy. That's, it's worked really well. So I would encourage people when trying to collaborate with people, try and uh, find a framework where you can cut people in so that mm -hmm. there's some people feel involved and, and, and part of it. And um, yeah. So it's a good, so useful technique. It's about For cooperation, sure. cooperation, collaboration, connectedness, and sharing. I love it, and that's a it's a great way to end. And I think uh, 
both with Ninja and your music and, and all your contributions to the, the music community, man. We're, we're super grateful and for you to be able to share that insight today on the podcast. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah, well, thank, thank you thank for coming out. Well, thank you very much for your support and interest. Hopefully we'll keep getting it vaguely right some of the time and uh, keep putting out some great music. And big love to everyone out there making music themselves or involved in business in any way. Um, enjoy it. and. Uh, Keep yeah, keep the enjoyment center screen, and keep also the idea. If I might sound a bit sententious, we're we're here to be of benefit. You know, music is a wonderful thing for the human race, and uh, let's enjoy it and let's use it for the benefit of all. That's what it's really about. It's not just a product. There we go. Can't can't end on a better note than that. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Damn, that was a great episode. What did you think, Jordan? Yeah, man, I think it was awesome. And, you know, like I said in the intro, just hearing from somebody who's been in the industry for that long and just seeing it grow over time, they just have a unique perspective on so many different things. And I'm just really glad that we got him on to actually pick his brain because, you know, I don't really talk to people who've been in the industry for as long as he has and especially has had like a founding role in a lot of the in a lot of the genres that I listen to today. So for sure. Shout out the bird chirping in the background. I think I think that bird enjoyed the episode too, but really enjoyed having the conversation with Matt. I think he obviously is a trailblazer in the electronic music industry. Um, and just hearing his artistic perspective on creating music, on the art of collaboration, on the rise and development of various technologies and hardware, I also found that really inspiring. So I think um, for you all to be able to carry that same level of passion and longevity in your careers, I think is something we should all really aspire towards. Um, so thank you, Matt. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening. And also thank you for Vidia. Like we mentioned, really, really incredible and powerful uh, distribution, rights management. I mean, if you're an artist, label, or manager, and you're really looking to kind of scale your business and take it to the next level, I think this is definitely a very, very powerful software system and, and product to be able to do so. So really want to encourage you guys to, to learn more and, and apply. Uh, on the video website. They created a unique application page exclusively for the Music Business Podcast listeners. So to, to go there, go to video.com slash MVP. That's V-Y-D-I-A dot com slash MVP. Um, and until next week, we out.